Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Okada from Beyond Clean, and on behalf of everyone on the Beyond Clean team, I would like to welcome you to Assure Be Sure conference, Sterility and Packaging in Sterile Processing. We have an incredible lineup of industry experts joining us for a full day of insightful presentations and candid conversations about all things sterile packaging. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our event sponsor, 3M, and in partnership with CCI for helping make this exciting day of virtual learning possible. For those of you that are anxiously awaiting your CE credits, after viewing all of today's sessions, you'll have access to the full conference survey and be able to download your CE certificate. We're excited that you've chosen to kick off your weekend by joining us for this one-of-a-kind event dedicated to packaging and sterility maintenance. I understand you probably have a lot going on between work and home, so I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for being dedicated to education and for doing something that will help you grow as a sterile processing professional. I promise there's a lot of great information coming your way, so sit back, relax, and start that sterilizer load. It's time to get this event started. Our first speaker is David DeGrossi. David has over 30 years of experience in the SPD profession, having been a technician, supervisor, and manager throughout his career. David is a voting member of the Amy ST79 workgroup and past president of Isham. Currently, he is the president of David DeGrossi Consulting LLC, offering sterile processing related education and consulting services to both medical companies and healthcare facilities. He also serves as the director of the One Source Speakers Bureau, where he helps develop and maintain live educational webinars and educational articles throughout the sterile processing profession. Today, David will provide critical insights into the common causes of sterilizer load recalls. You will discover best practice techniques for minimizing or eliminating sterilization load recalls in your sterile processing department once and for all. The what's, why's, and how's of sterilization load recalls will finally be answered. So without further ado, kicking off the Assure Be Sure conference, David DeGrossi. Great, uh, Adam. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, good morning. And uh, what better way than to have Dave DeGrossi kind of wake you up? Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, yeah, let's get into um, this very important subject. Um, you know, when things go right, they certainly go right. But when they go wrong, we need to know what to do. Uh, let's put up our disclaimer here. And um, it's very important that... Um, uh, the bottom two, I always like to focus on, you know, instructions for use. We're always going to look at our instructions for use. And I just, uh, I always like this bottom sentence because it's true in everything we do uh, that it's, this is general information, but that nothing should be done in isolation. Uh, you should never take one source of information to run, to run with. You should always look at all of your sources of information and then make your best decisions based on that. Uh, again, thank you, 3M. Thank you, Beyond Clean, and thank you all for being here. As Adam alluded to, uh, I've been in the sterile processing world for over 30 years and uh, was very active with my state chapter, uh, got involved with the um, Amy Group uh, back in 2006, 2007, right around that mark. I really can't remember uh, that uh, exact date, but... Uh, it was really great becoming a, a voting member on that group and getting involved with development of standards and guidelines. Uh, you know, that's a very important thing. You'll hear me talk about that a lot. I want to always encourage you guys to get involved. We need more users like yourselves involved on these committees so that we can have the most accurate and uh, up-to-date content that's available. You know, my my involvement with the local chapter uh, naturally led to an involvement with Isham. I did about six years with Isham, uh, running and being on the board, being president and an active uh, past president. And as Adam alluded to before, I was able to uh, grow my consulting business up to the point where three years ago I do this full time now. And um, it's great because I think I can really reach a lot more uh, folks and doing audits and Getting out there and seeing a lot of your departments is just wonderful. So let's jump in. What are our learning objectives for today? Let's talk about what could go wrong when we're reprocessing and sterilizing goods within the SPD or the CSS, whatever we decide to call ourselves. What are the considerations for establishing any protocols, policies, and procedures? Very important. Um, 
you know, a lot of us, and, and we'll talk about this later in the slides, you know, a lot of us are using rapid technology and, and um, there still is potential for failures and still the need for a recall, even using a rapid technology. But um, that still doesn't uh, mean that we don't have to have policies and procedures surrounding that. I do find that very lacking a lot of times when I perform audits. We'll determine how to minimize this or eliminate it. What good is learning all this if, if uh, we don't like to be reactive, right? We don't want to see a failure and say, it's really great. We really, really are aces at what to do once we fail. Well, the whole name of the game is learning not to fail or not to have a process failure, right? So uh, that's really the key and the secret here. So with that, what could possibly go wrong? Well, a lot could go wrong, uh, as you all know. Uh, it's a very uh, detailed process, uh, sterilization. So a lot of factors, a lot of, uh, a lot of things that go into it. So we have to monitor these processes. And then we'll say to ourselves, what does Amy have to say about it? And uh, for those of you that might be new on here, yes, that's, that could be a misspelling, but a lot of folks think Amy is a person. They'll say, oh, who is she? Uh, well, it's not a person. It's the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. They have a number of documents out there, a num number of uh, standards that, um, that we can use as resources. The primary one is ST79. That was uh, published in 2017. We had uh, some amendments come out uh, in late 2020. So as an FYI and a heads up, there is um, new amendments out there, A1, A2, A3, that came out last year, pretty late in 2020. So heads up on that, um, just quickly, the A1 amendment was covering environmental services, fans, food and drink. Um, I know that sounds almost like a football game, but it's not. We, we're literally covering how to clean in the, the uh, SPD area, uh, both the clean and dirty sides. We're talking about, we had to address fans because in a lot of instances, people are hot and decontam and they might be potentially putting up fans, which is moving air around. So that's addressed. And of course, food and drink, because nobody here would ever have food or drink in the department, correct? And you might say, yeah, Dave, we, we would never, I would never eat my sandwich out here, but you know, what about that little Snickers bar in your pocket? You know, I, I kind of see what's going on out there. So it addresses food and drink. A2, Amendment A2 uh, looks at in, in, uh, inspection of insulated instruments. Very critical, very important. Update on that. Any insulated instrument that we're testing should, or, or uh, processing should be tested uh, with an insulation tester. So that section addresses that. And then um, A3 uh, speaks to the frequency of cleaning um, sterilizers and uh, routine maintenance, which we will cover later in one of the slides, which is very important element. Um, your sterilizer maintenance is very important. A4 addressed, um, the BI lot numbers, just uh, the the matching of the lot number to the test that you're using and the recording of such. So heads up on that. If you own the ST79 document, you should have gotten a, a free copy of these amendments. Amy did its best to kind of reach out to you, but uh, they did miss a lot of people. So you could contact Amy and uh, request a copy of those amendments. If you uh, wanted to, you could also update your book and get get a new copy with it all incorporated in there. In either case, make sure you have a copy of um, the document. So uh, generally speaking, um, I don't like to usually directly quote out of the books, but you'll see a lot of that today out of the um, the guidelines. So because it's it's that important. And I, wanna, I want you to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Uh, in section 13 of the Amy document, ST79, you'll see that this addresses the monitoring and mechanical cleaning of all the equipment, uh, product ID, those are our load labels, traceability, uh, physical, chemical, biological monitoring, residual air removal, or Bowie-Dick test, as a lot of us refer to it, 
testing of the dynamic air removal sterilizers and then periodic, you know, we can't forget about this on the back end, the periodic product quality assurance, product recalls related uh, quality control measures. So that's where this is all derived from. Uh, for today's lesson or today's uh, webinar, we're going to focus on steam, but, you know, recalls could occur with anything that we're sterilizing. It's not just steam sterilization. It could be with our low temperature modalities, um, which, you know, by a lot of people refer to by brand names such as uh, Sterat or Vpro, but anything low temperature. And, of course, ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is still out there. It is still a safe an effective method if done properly. So the big three, right? The Trinity, as I call it. When we are sterilizing goods, we look to these three areas so that we can assure that something is sterile. On the left, you can see a printout from the sterilizer. So uh, we would look at that as a physical or a mechanical um, device or uh, monitor where we're making sure that the program settings, what we told the sterilizer to do, it's going to do. An important thing to know about these printouts is that they're going to tell you what you program the sterilizer to do. So uh, I'm saying this because in my past, uh, I was uh, in a department when I was a technician and the uh, sterilizer repair man had come in and he was running some tests on the sterilizer and changed the exposure settings. Yeah, I believe at the time, you know, the newer machines, the newer models sometimes won't let you go below four minutes. But certainly uh, back in the day, uh, we were able to turn that exposure time to zero. He was doing some kind of testing and then he never changed it back. And two cycles were run. And of course, all the parameters on the printout said yes, 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 because we, it, the machine was programmed with zero exposure. So in, in today's world, it's more likely that you might have had uh, a device that needed an extended exposure time and may, perhaps you ran it on a four minute cycle instead of a 10 minute cycle. Again, it's gonna say yes, 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 and reach the parameters, but was it the correct cycle? So uh, it's a little more tricky. Um, you're not signing those tickets, you're verifying them. So uh, a lot of things I'll see when I do audits is um, when people are recording those uh, printouts, there could be different styles. You'll see some people circle certain areas of it. You have to make sure that you're consistent with that. Uh, just a little tip um, and a little trick of the trade because when, when your accreditation agencies come in, they look for consistency in record keeping on any of this. So make sure uh, some people feel like, uh, some technicians feel like they're going above and beyond by potentially circling extra things or uh, documenting extra things. We have to be consistent. One thing that the accreditation bodies look for, they go through the record log and they look for consistency. Um, they're going to ask you, you know, if someone's circling things and someone isn't, they're going to say, show me your policy. What should the record keeping look like? So heads up on all of this record keeping. In the center, we have our um, Bowie Dick test, which is uh, air removal test. Uh, that's uh, run daily. And on the right, of course, we have a biological test that is at the apex or at the top of uh, how we assure that things are sterile. But when the three of these things come together, then with confidence, we can release products uh, to our patients, to our customers, and to our patients. Uh, let's talk about the frequency of monitoring. Amy covers this. They cover it in a number of areas, table two, table three, and in the section listed um, on your screen, 13.5.3.2. Okay, so the physical, every cycle printout, right? Those are our printouts. So every time something prints out, it's being verified. Notice it says verified, not signed. Signing is just putting your name on something. Verifying is looking at it, confirming your parameters were met, and then placing your signature on it. Chemical, uh, your indicators are usually in every package. Let's hope, right? Better be. Um, your external process indicators, uh, those are the ones that, that, that turn color and make sure that they were that we could identify whether it went into the sterilizer or not. Your Bowie Dick is run daily. Um, 
that is uh, pretty much a given. Uh, now, let's just talk about that briefly because some departments are able to write a policy uh, that is when the sterilizer is in use. So when they say daily, um, if you go into the weekends and you're only using one sterilizer out of three, or maybe you close on a Sunday, uh, you don't have to send somebody in there and start the autoclave up and um, do the testing. So uh, make sure that's outlined in your policies. Biological, okay, we'll get into this. We're gonna look at that uh, coming up in a little more detail. Your biological should be at least weekly, but preferably every day. That's This is language right out of the document. Every day that the sterilizer is in use and with implant loads. So I want to also give you a heads up that the accreditation agencies and even some of the Department of Public Health inspections, they don't look at that word preferably lightly. They really look uh, and put an emphasis on the every day, okay? So um, that's great, but uh, we shouldn't live in a world where we're worried about uh, accreditation agencies and getting caught doing something wrong. We wanna do things right because of the safety of our patients and, and um, lowering our risk, lowering, lowering the possibility of harming those patients. And we'll get into that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Cycle monitoring, okay. So uh, we, we hopefully put all of our packaging together correctly. We load it into the sterilizer correctly and uh, all of our parameters are met, right? Um, so once that cycle is complete, we want to inspect all of our parameters, run our, um, incubate any tests that need to be incubated, and make sure that everything is good. If these parameters, or any of them, were not met, we could have a product recall on our hands. So um, that's pretty much instant. Things come out of the sterilizer. We're able to look at certain things. Uh, we do have some incubation time with the biological. Of course, if you did have an implant device, that would be quarantined. But routine items are not subject to quarantine. Uh, now you say, well, uh, why would items be released? Well, items are released because uh, the incubation time is there for the uh, for the sterilizer. I mean, for the biological test. And how frequently are you running your BI? So. Um, you want to make sure that you're meeting those guidelines and that your incubation, a lot of times I'll come in and I'll see um, the, the tests are run and you're using a super rapid BI readout that only reads in a matter of uh, less than 25 minutes. And, uh, but it takes a half hour to get into the incubator. Sometimes they sit on the sterilizer card. So, you know, we're defeating the purpose there. We want to get those, um, it's a balance between not getting it in there too fast you got to look at the IFU because you don't want the uh, ampule to explode, but then you also don't want it to sit on the cart for 45 minutes. So um, we want to take a look at that. So when could there be other instances? We release the goods and um, potentially an end user opens up a package and there's a wet pack. Maybe there's moisture inside of the uh, devices we sterilized. What if the chemical indicator didn't turn? Uh, we're not going to know that down in SPD. We're, the end user is going to know that when they open up the package. So that's going to trigger an alarm again. Uh, we're not necessarily saying that that's an immediate recall, but that is an area where you need to develop that and determine your pathways. You need to decide, you know, what is our process if a single uh, device goes upstairs and there is wetness inside? You can use the guidance documents, get your team together, determine what you're going to do. Are you going to inspect? Are you going to reject the entire load at that point? Or are you going to do random sampling? Um, it really is up to your department to use the guidelines and determine how your individual facility is going to handle that. Um, other areas where, you know, you have a negative or a, uh, I'm sorry, a positive BI, that's very clear cut. But it's in these areas where it gets a little murky, um, where, the, where you could potentially have wetness in just a single pack or um, a single indicator uh, might have turned um, or been, been uh, right on the edge of turning. Okay, if that does occur, Amy has these wonderful 
uh, this wonderful guidance in the document. Uh, ST79 has these um, these uh, algorithms and flow charts that actually help you get to the root cause. You can see a smaller version of this on the left-hand side. It's figure 10 within the document. Um, this is the decision tree for conducting investigation of steam sterilization process failures. And on the top left, you can see it's telling you um, the CI failures, the BI failures, and then the physical monitor failures. And it's giving you all this work was done for you. That's the great thing about it. And that's why I always like to say that the wheel pretty much has been invented. And you just need to figure out a way to make it go faster. Uh, but a lot of a lot of your leg work's been done for you. A lot of people spend a lot of time on these algorithms. You could purchase this. They have larger posters of this so that it's not just in a book. Um, it, it's a very useful tool. It helps you uh, get to the root cause and figure out why that failure occurred. Okay, let's talk about policy and procedure because, again, very important to um, have something written. Uh, often uh, I go in and um, talk with people and uh, things are just not in policy form. People can speak to processes and they know them very well, but then I ask to see a policy or a procedure and it's not, it's not there or it's, or it's very limited. So let's make sure that our policies and procedures are robust. Um, these things can happen. Uh, it, it's almost Murphy's Law. These, the, you know, these events can happen any time. It's not usually going to happen during normal business hours. It's going to happen overnight on a weekend or on a holiday. So you have to be prepared for the staff that's there has to be able to go to the policy and procedure and know what to do. Okay, again, we go to the Amy document in section 14.5. It's giving us guidance, telling us what the policies and procedures sh uh, should contain. And that's a pretty strong word coming from Amy. When they say should, um, there's not a lot of wiggle room there. Uh, it, it's not saying maybe or perhaps. I mean, that's a very strong word. It's one of the strongest words they can use in the document. So your policies and procedures should be written. They should be reviewed periodically. Uh, that is so important. Um, the times change and technology changes. And sometimes you'll see uh, when you look at policies and procedures, You'll see a creation date and then an annual up, an annual check. Um, well, if that if that document was created in 2010 and it's just been kind of checked, uh, we got to make sure that the tech, new technologies have been incorporated in there. Perhaps your policy is old and doesn't have the more rapid technology um, in there. It's still referring to a 24 or, God forbid, a 48 hour uh, test the, the readout. So. Make sure your policies are updated and revised. Uh, now, you also want to be, uh, you have to have these things ready, uh, readily available to your staff. We talked about that. It could be on an uh, off time or a weekend. Uh, we want to make sure whether this is on the intranet or still in a paper book. Make sure that policy book isn't locked in the supervisor's office when the supervisor goes home. It should be out there for the staff. It should also, uh, look at this, uh, Section E covers quite a bit. It's gonna address training and education, medical device processing protocols, um, equipment maintenance, that's your sterilizers or whatever devices you're using to uh, sterilize, product ID and traceability, all the, th the big three we talked about, and then your recalls. And uh, I, I love in Amy, they always have a rationale they put in there. Um, the rationale helps explain a little bit more what they were trying to get to or what the point of this uh, of the of the uh, statement was. So in this instance, it says policies and procedures should provide guidance to personnel and can facilitate consistency in practice. So we all want to try to do, like I mentioned, uh, circling uh, the, the, the printouts, you know, like we want consistency. So make sure that. Um, a good, robust policy and procedure, everyone should adhere to it, and we should be consistent. Um, we talked about that periodic review and revision uh, because new information is coming out all the time. The policy development, uh, it shouldn't be done in a vacuum. You should take into consideration uh, the users or the uh, customers involved 
or the medical departments that you're sterilizing for. It's not just the operating room. Uh, the CS or SPD services, you know, we used to say we, we service the hospital, but hospitals have become systems, right? Um, they're health systems, sometimes with multiple hospitals or sometimes a hospital with multiple clinics in the surrounding area or a surgical center. So we serve a lot more than the operating room. Um, so we want to know, like, what will the nature of a recall be on an offsite or if it's a closed facility, what if it happens on a weekend and the surgical center is closed or one of the clinics is closed? Do we get in there? We want to we want to figure this all out before it occurs. So, but we also want to have a team involved, not just the users um, or the customers, but we want to get infection prevention and potentially risk uh, involved with that. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we, we'll touch on why risk should be in there uh, in a little bit. Uh, it's critical that this policy states who oversees the recall process. There should be a designated person to facilitate the process. Someone has to be in charge and uh, someone has to kind of take the lead on this. So um, that's going to be very important because um, someone has to coordinate all this. Uh, the process determining uh, what needs to be recalled and how. The potentially affected areas do this, and it should be clear. So that's why we want to get them involved uh, when we're developing the policy. If the recall is large enough, there may be a need for all hands on deck. I mean, if you're a large, large facility, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of goods potentially to recall. Um, and, you know, if need be, we have to pull in uh, folks to help us. So patient safety, right? We always do no harm. Uh, that's our goal. That's what the SPD is there for. We're um, frontline um, on the war uh, on infection. As with everything we do, uh, it, that is our end goal. We got to recall these items as soon as possible before they're used on a patient. If the items are used on a patient, the team should work out a procedure on how to determine if and how there will be patient notification. So this is where risk would be involved. Uh, typically, the first steps are contacting the end users and then the physicians involved that might have used those devices on the patients. And then collectively, the team needs to make a decision as to what would occur next uh, as far as patient notification. Preparing for these scenarios in advance always makes a stressful, challenging situation more manageable and clear as to what we need to do uh, when it does actually occur. Um, so we go back to the Amy document again uh, in, in these two sections here. Um, we want to just go over the bullets here once again that the written policies and procedures right there on section A it's talking about uh, it's the, the policy should be developed in collaboration. Infection, it says it right there with infection control uh, and risk management of the healthcare facility. The policy should outline the circumstances for issuing a recall. It should designate the department or individual responsible for initiating the recall when there is evidence of a, a failure. And it needs to establish notification procedures and compliance with regulatory, um, that's federal, state, local, and accrediting agency requirements. So uh, there's your bullets right there. Again, uh, the rationale. Recall policies help expedite the retrieval of process items that are suspected to be non-sterile. So we want to capture these items before they're used on a patient. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the 24 and 48. Back in my day, uh, we only had a 48-hour biological readout. So when we had a failure, we were looking at uh, two days of goods. That's a lot of patients that are affected. Uh, with today's newer technologies, we've reduced the time that it takes to incubate. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But there still is the potential that goods get released. And um, even, with a, even with a BI that is negative, we could, like we mentioned earlier, have wetness or we could have failure of the uh, chemical indicator. So we've got to kind of map out all these different scenarios. Okay, the recall uh, procedure, uh, again, in this section, it talks about um, 
when specifically talking about the recall, it says a recall should be issued that. And so these are your parameters specifically of what you have to do when there is a recall. You may uh, include the quarantine and retrieval. So you might have goods in the department still on a sterilizer cart. And while you're going through this process, you're going to want to hold that and not have any of that product be released. Um, and if, if there is a, a positive BI, again, we have to go back to the last known negative biological test. Um, B, uh, is it immediately communicated to the departments and followed by a written order? So make sure you, you note that. Uh, we need to document it. Identified by the sterilizer lot number, the products to be recalled. Now, uh, a lot of us have load labels. Um, most of, Some of us are fortunate enough to have tracking systems or computer systems like SPM and others that may facilitate this a little faster. We'll be able to know exactly where goods went, and when they went, or where they are. Um, but either way, that's why we need our product identification, because we need to be able to recall it. D, you identify the persons uh, to whom the order is addressed. E, you want to require the recording of this in terms of uh, the kind of quantity and the products obtained in the recall. So we want to we want to know if we are looking at 50 items uh, on, a, on a sterilizer cart. Um, you know, where are they? What are they? And how many of those at the end of the recall, how many of them were actually recalled? Hopefully it was 50. But if it's 48, we're going to try to pinpoint and say, OK, where were those two items and try to trace it to the actual user and the patient. Uh, F, specify the action to be taken by the persons receiving the order. In other words, what did we do with those goods that we recalled? We reopened them and uh, reprocessed them um, would be ideal. Uh, again, uh, this is a repeat of the slide. I guess I, it was so important that I copied the slide in there twice. Um, we are going to determine how to minimize or eliminate the recall entirely. So let's let's talk about trying to be proactive. Um, we want to definitely look at uh, staff training and staff proficiency. Uh, that's always a key in any of this. Um, we want to make sure that the staff are acutely aware of, you know, not just how they're doing things. A lot of times we teach people the motions, uh, press this button, just put the put the cart in there and press the button. We're not really telling them, uh, eventually you need to tell them what's actually happening once you hit the button, explaining the whys and the hows. So staff training is uh, crucial. And then competencies and making sure that they have absorbed that and uh, if it's critical enough, you might want to repeat that uh, at least on an annual basis. Uh, so very critical that training is, is done and um, staff are kept aware of the latest um, technologies. Regular and ongoing maintenance of equipment. Okay, so the sterilizers themselves, it is crucial that the sterilizers, uh, they're, they're, they're medical devices. They... The sterilizer has its own IFU, and uh, you shouldn't see service personnel in there just when something fails or the machine breaks, uh, so to speak. Um, the sterilizer uh, it, it outlines for the service personnel, just like your mo just like your car. That's probably the best analogy. You wouldn't uh, bring your car to the car dealer. Uh, when the check engine light comes on or, uh, you know, you, hopefully before the check engine light came on, you were going to the car dealership, changing your oil, uh, rotating your tires and doing whatever the car maintenance schedule said you had to do. Same thing for a sterilizer. OK, um, there's steam traps. There's components that only have a certain amount of life cycle. They need to be replaced proactively, not after they fail. Uh, they could fail. Uh, your sterilizer might say replace the steam trap every six months. It could fail in three months. Um, you know, it's hard when something is time-based uh, because it depends on how busy your facility is. If, um, you know, if something says replace every six months and you're a super busy facility, it might fail in three months. So uh, that's why we want to make sure we have a robust, proactive maintenance uh, plan in place for the sterilizers. 
uh, leak testing. Okay, we're not talking about Bowie Dick testing. Sterilizers, and this has been big lately with um, with the auditors or uh, the accre accreditation agencies. You know, your sterilizer can perform a leak test. Look to your IFU. Um, that's one of your assignments. You know, if you take away anything, uh, go. It'll take you five minutes. Just go and look for your IFU and see what the IFU for the sterilizer says regarding the leak test. It's going to tell you when and how often you should potentially run the leak test. And that's a setting within the uh, autoclave that looks to see uh, does its own built-in leak test. Um, there's been a lot of questions around that lately. And of course, what are the answers? You go to the IFU. The sterilizer manufacturer will tell you when and how you should do that. Steam quality, huge. Um, a lot of us use house steam. We use steam from the boiler plant. Um, that steam, you know, essentially was intended to heat, sometimes cool the building, uh, but then we kind of drill a hole into the pipe and pull it into the sterilizer. Uh, some of us are lucky enough to take that steam and we could uh, do a clean steam system. We could use the house steam to, to boil uh, more purified water to make clean steam. Some people may even have their own dedicated boilers, but... Um, I don't really see that too often out there, but uh, rather than it's a steam to steam system, but the steam quality is super important. Um, you know, we could have non condensable gases and um, other things that can contribute to wet packs and also contribute to sterilizer failures. You know, that steam quality, you open up your autoclave chamber and you look at the walls of your chamber, um, that's going to be reflective of what your instruments will eventually look like. Uh, we, but, but they don't because most of us have a very robust maintenance program in place to keep our instruments nice and shiny and uh, new and refurbished and sharp, right? Well, why don't we treat the sterilizer the same way? It's just as critical. Um, you need to look at your chambers and really determine what you need to do. Like I said, if, if are you cleaning annually, you should have your chambers at least looked at and uh, potentially cleaned annually but if you're a super busy department you might have to step up the frequency of that so uh something you want to take a look into performance monitoring all right so there's devices uh on the market that you know there's pass fail and then there's interpretive devices the pass fail devices are more or less devices that um let's just say it's a white dot and once it goes into the sterilizer it turns a black color that's Kind of a pass or fail you're all familiar usually with the moving front indicator that's an indicator where a little pellet melts under certain conditions and it moves forward to cross over a pass line if you will so those are a little more interpretive they can tell you more uh of what's going on inside of a cycle so it takes a little bit more to look at devices like that and interpret whether they've passed or failed. So it's very important that we know how to use those and um, are we using those. So um, we want to look at the frequency of testing. That's going to be coming up on the next couple slides. We're almost there, gang. We're getting there. Temperature monitoring guns and other post-sterilization wet pack information. So, you know, we, uh, post-cycle, um, what are we doing um, one of the easier audits I performed one day with a, I went into a client, went into a hospital that was having a wet pack problem. And the minute I walked into the uh, sterilization area, I said, what's that cart over there? You know, they have a big cart over there. I said, oh, that's our cool down rack. And I said, okay, well, there's your wet pack problem. So, uh, you know, they didn't have enough carriages or uh, sterilizer carts. So um, clearly we don't want to touch packages. Today's technology, I mean, God knows with the COVID uh, everyone's seen these temperature guns out there, little digital guns that we can check the temperature of packages. Um, we want to make sure that we get these devices down to room temperature, and we want to um, make sure that, uh, uh, particularly with uh, items that are larger, with more metal mass, we you know those temperature guns are giving you a relative idea of the temperature on the outside, but if you have a set with a lot of metal mass in it, you don't want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're hitting that set in different areas with the temperature gun. But the point is, if you put a warm package on a cool shelf, 
you're going to wick the moisture out of the room. You're going to create condensate or water or wetness inside of the packs. Um, a lot of times uh, there are instances where the moisture could be created in chamber because you're having a steam issue. But more often than not, there's, uh, there's problems with um, post-sterilization. Uh, Amy has a very big uh, section on moisture assessment uh, within the document. Uh, moisture assessment in Amy means wet packs, okay? So if you look in the book and you look in the glossary um, or the index and you're looking for wet packs, you'll never see it. You got to look up moisture assessment. And Amy has, again, these wonderful charts of what to do if there's a wet pack, how to chase that back and what the potential uh, was and uh, why did it fail or why did you get a uh, wetness? So that's all been done for you. That's in the document. Okay, we'll talk about this routine um, efficacy testing. Again, this is out of the document. We talked about the weekly, preferably daily for the uh, BI testing. This is directly out of the Amy document. Now, we talk about that because, you know, if you're a facility and you're just running a test on Monday, and then let's just say there's the potential. Some people batch their implant devices if they can, and then they try tend to try to run them all on one cycle. So potentially, uh, it, the, based on the nature of cases and procedures done, if you test on Monday, you, you, there could be a potential that you can go a day or days before an implant device is put on a cycle and another BI test is run. So, um, you know, there there's a larger... Uh, potential for more goods to be used. And we'll break that down for you a little bit. Um, if you guys recall on the recall that it spoke to um, that if a recall procedure of process items are suspected to be non-sterile, a recall should be issued that A, may include quarantine, and then you got to retrieve back to that last negative BI. So again, in that scenario, uh, where you test weekly, um, hopefully those cycles, I've seen people do a number of things. I've seen people, um, they put into place uh, policies sometimes that if they're not running implants, some people will test daily, but then they'll also run a noon test and then an, an evening test. Um, that's certainly breaking down the amount of goods also, but there's there's an even better way to kind of get there and eliminate this um we talked about the other devices uh loads complaining implantable devices should be monitored with the pcd so it's important to um always remind you that um in case there's the need for an implantable device even if you have a bi on the cycle and even if you have a rapid readout technology it may be needed in an emergency. We live in an emergency world, so to speak. Uh, there could be trauma. There could be uh, emergency cases where life and let life and limb are on the line, and the doctor may need that set. Uh, Amy has a document inside uh, ST seventy nine. It's the early release form, and the reason why we run the class or the type five CI is that um, that mimics the death. A curve of the BI. So they're matched together. We're releasing, or we would early release if potentially needed based on that type five indicator. And then hopefully shortly thereafter, we would get a readout, um, a negative readout of our biological. The form is available for copy. They do allow you to copy it and use it. And it is uh, partially filled out by the physician. Um, very good uh, to know, very important to remember. Now, uh, I drew this little diagram, kind of corny, but effective. I like to just remind people that if you look at the big three that we, we try to achieve to release a sterile good, killing biologicals is at the apex or at the top of that pyramid. Um, ultimately, what are we doing? We're killing organisms, right? So the b most effective way to demonstrate or prove that is by killing organisms. And that's what we do when we run these biological tests. So again, we want all of these three parameters to come together to be able to release goods with confidence. Uh, we're gonna look at this little scenario here I created. And um, again, let's talk about one autoclave. So we have one autoclave that we're running 
And let's just say you're not, forget about weekly testing. This is, let's just say you're doing daily testing and there was no biological, I'm sorry, there was no implants on any of your other loads for that day. So you ran 10 cycles. On the first cycle, you ran a BI. The rest of the day, there was no implants. Uh, therefore, you didn't run any other BIs on this autoclave. So we're also going to assume that there was, um, you know, 10, um, I'm sorry, 20 items on each cycle that you ran throughout the day. So if we do the math, uh, 10 cycles uh, would average 200 items. So, you know, 10 times 20. Um, or to, yeah, either way. So, you know, you have 200 items potentially out of one autoclave that day. So theoretically, you know, you have 200 items that are going out to all different areas throughout the system that potentially can be used on up to 200 patients. Um, you know, uh, that's doing a daily test. You know, there are people out there doing the weekly and with implants. So, you know, I, I describe this as, the window of liability, um, you know, it's just a much larger window of um, risk. You know, um, I always like to put it in, the, in this perspective. If um, you were to run, a, a, it's called every load monitoring. If you ran a BI on every cycle and the cycle that you just pulled out of the autoclave fails, what does our literature tell us? We have to recall back to the last known negative BI. So that would only be the last preceding cycle. So you're lowering that window of risk. You're lowering that window of liability. And then I also like to put it in this perspective. What if you were coming in for surgery? What if your loved one was coming in for surgery? Your kids, your parents. Wouldn't you want a BI on your cycle? Would you say to somebody, uh, hopefully you wouldn't say to somebody, hey, who's, who's this? hopefully you have enough confidence in your department that you, you're not concerned who's putting your instrument sets together. But more importantly, would you say to yourself, gee, can you make sure you run a BI on my instruments? We want to make sure that we have a standard of care and a standard of safety for all the patients involved. So it's something to consider. Um if we don't, we again, just like the BI, the patient should be at the top of our apex and directly under that should be our liability because um, we are lowering our risk. If we have to notify a patient that your procedure went well, and like I told you, let's go back to my old days of 48 hours. We used to go two days and if a biological went positive and we made the decision to notify the patients, the patient would be told, by the doctor, your procedure went wonderful, but unfortunately we used unsterile instruments on you. Um, I'm pretty sure, um, you know, the lawyers were probably calling the next day. So uh, take that all into consideration. Um, make sure you have robust policies and uh, we wanna lower our window of liability and risk by testing every cycle. That's, um, what I did when I was running my departments. Again, here it is, we call it every load monitoring, uh, but you're gonna catch more errors quickly. You're gonna reduce the amount of goods that you'll potentially have to actually recall. Um, you know, again, earlier in the program, we were talking about uh, the rapid and uh, the super rapid technology. So, you know, you could even get down to a time basis, you know, where uh, I remember when it went from 48 to 24, that was good. And then 24 down to, I think it was eight and six. And, you know, now we're at 24 minutes. So, you know, I th we, we have the capability. We shouldn't be releasing goods that are that hot. You're going to need more than 24 minutes for a, a, a cart to cool down. So theoretically, we are quarantining. Um, anything before that BI is read because it has to cool down. So if you're not on any kind of rapid technology, that's another reason to consider it uh, because you're, you, you're essentially have the ability to almost quarantine everything. So that's it. And uh, I want to thank you guys for a number of things. I want to thank you all for doing your part during this pandemic and what you do on a daily basis. And if you're not sure of what you do, I'm going to remind you, you do nothing less than uh, save and improve pa patients' lives on a daily basis. Um, you're the front guard, you're the front line. 
We're fighting across the nation. I'm, I implore all of you to get involved with the fight. You, uh, nothing's ever handed to us in the sterile processing department. We've always had to fight for what we wanted or what we needed. So no one's going to hand you recognition. No one's going to hand you more compensation. If you want to see those things, we need you to be at these committees. We need you to get involved, and we need you to fight beyond the daily fight in your department, okay? That's how we'll all get there. We'll get there together. And with that, I want to thank you. And uh, I believe we may have some time for some questions. Yeah. Hey, David, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Adam. Awesome. Perfect. So, yeah, if you do have questions for David, please send them in um, and uh, we'll get them answered for you. Uh, first one here, what are the most common reasons for sterilization recalls? Is it equipment failure, user error? What uh, What do you feel like the most common reasons for the recalls are? Yeah, great question. Uh, there's nothing that I'm aware of scientifically uh, that was out there. Um, I remember working with some folks on the Amy committees um, that uh, some folks that actually worked for with Genninga, and they used to go in and troubleshoot as to why equipment failed. And uh, I think a majority of it was typically um, it was it was pretty much balanced between the autoclave, a failure in the autoclave, and human error, which you know is a large piece of the pie. If you look under human error, there could be a lot of subsections to that, but. Um, it was typically um, typically uh, sterilizer failures. Sterilizer failures. Okay. Have you ever seen that, uh, like steam quality or water quality being involved with, say, wet packs and recalls and things like that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, your steam quality. Again, I mentioned that during the program that wet packs can occur in cycle, if you will. And uh, let's just take that for instance. Um, we talked about the IFU of the sterilizer, right? Look at that IFU of the sterilizer. That sterilizer is going to tell you how many goods you can place in it per cycle. There is a set amount of metal mass that you can place in the autoclave. So uh, you want to make sure that that's um, you're not over. You're not going over that. So. Uh, let's just say the autoclave says that you can place 16 25 pound trays in it. Uh, they're going to give you different formulas. It may give you a total. It may give you a weight. Um, they're giving you that because scientifically the autoclave, uh, when you run a cycle, steam is going to come in and, and condensate. It's going to turn to liquid water. That's naturally what happens in every cycle. The magic is during the dry phase, we re-evaporate that liquid water back into steam vapor. So the autoclave is only capable of re-evaporating so much water. So let's just say under that formula, now these aren't exact numbers, but just for the sake of a, a, a lesson here, if, it, if an autoclave says you can put 16 trays in there, and let's just set it, say it, those 16 trays will generate a liter of water. The minute you put one additional tray on there, you're gonna have a liter of water, a liter and one ounce of water. The autoclave isn't forgiving. It's not going to give you a break. That one ounce of water is going to remain over in, in the form of liquid water, either in a packet, on the package or in a package. So making sure that you don't exceed the metal mass that your autoclave is capable of is super important towards uh, looking at solving the wet pack problems. Um, you know, cart loading and unloading is also another big factor with that also. So that that's a great question. Perfect. That was, that was an awesome answer. I love the explanation about the steam because uh, you're absolutely right. That dense metal mass and those heavy sets that are, are all over the trays. And if there's no space Correct. between them, those are all things uh, that can contribute to those. Uh, so know, here's Adam, another question we, for you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, we, we tend, we tend, we all know, hopefully by now, that we can't put a metal tray over a wrap tray. But sometimes uh, just the configuration of the sterilizer car is just as important if you have a very hard to dry tray that's typically harder to dry we always want to try to get that on the top shelf of the sterilizer i'll go into facilities and they'll say that tray is always hard to dry and it's in the middle or it's you know on the bottom i always tell people to look at the autoclave truck and think of a waterfall because all that liquid condensate from the top shelf is falling to the middle shelf and both top and middle shelf 
are all raining down onto the very bottom shelf. So if you have always a typically hard to dry set, always try to get those up on the very top shelf. Absolutely. That's, that's excellent advice. Thank you for that. Um, here's another question for you. So if an alternate cycle fails, so let's say you're testing a Sterad machine, which has multiple cycles, like an express cycle, do you have to recall all the loads back to the last negative bio? So all of those different standard, all those different uh, loads, or do you only recall the express loads if that, that specific load failed? You know, that's a great question. Um, I would refer to the manufacturers. Uh, you know, in, in today's world, we have we have a uh, we have biological tests from multiple manufacturers, and then there are multiple sterilization units on the market. I would refer back to their specific instructions for that. But I think a, a very important thing to note is uh, I recently did a LinkedIn um, question or a uh, poll question about this and it was pretty surprising that a lot of folks that have gotten to the point of testing every steam sterilization cycle with biological indicators are only testing daily on the sterad um it's just something to consider again for consistency and typically if um you know speaking just off the cuff without having the information in front of me you know, I would tend to think that if a if one cycle fails a biological, that that's a problem with the sterilizer. You're most likely going to fail any different cycle, whether it was flex or express. Uh, a positive BI is going to is going to push you to um, have those units looked at and uh, have service personnel come in and see what's going on with the sterilizer. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of goes back to your point earlier of. You know, if this was you on the table, if this is your loved one on the table, would you feel comfortable using something after something has failed like that, even if it was Correct. on a different cycle, on the, but coming out of that machine? So it's, you know, trying to think of it from those terms, I think, is probably good advice some for of these, everyone out there. Some of these Sterad uh, units, you know, or, or, or um, you know, Steris um, units, uh, people run these things all day long. You know, some facilities, they run one or two, but I've seen facilities where they run them straight through all day. So again, if you're running that BI in the morning, it, it if it fails or goes positive, you have to go back to the last known negative. So you're going to be recalling. And usually, if anything, the, the uh, low temperature goods are usually going right out because they're rapidly, because it's a rapid turnover, we're using them quickly throughout the day. So um, something to consider. Yeah, absolutely. I knew that. And that was something that, that we had in our facilities. I know was, you know, if we did do once a day, we were doing cameras and those cameras are going directly to the OR. Those scopes are going directly to the OR. Yeah. And so when we recall, we were like, well, we don't actually have any of the goods. There. Everything's already been used. Uh, so that Correct. sort of defeats the purpose of the recall. Now you're doing patient notifications and surgeon notifications and that is never a fun process. So yeah, every load monitoring, you avoid that for sure. Adam, um, I'm not sure if you, you, you've you experienced this also, but you know, especially when the newer, uh, we've had a lot, a slew of newer rapid technology uh, BIs come out for the low temperature and it, it's identifying a lot more failures. So if there's gonna be any area where we're seeing more positivity, it's in the low temperature uh, sterilizers. Yes, absolutely. You're, that's a good point. Excellent point. Yeah. All right. So so we're kind of running out of time. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next session. David, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us about sterilization load recalls. I know I learned a lot. Uh, and thank you guys out there for your incredible engagement this early in the morning. We had a lot of great questions uh, that we just don't have time for. So that if you do have questions uh, for David, uh, go ahead and send him an email. His contact information is on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we'll make sure that if you were did submit questions, we'll make sure David gets them and uh, we'll send him. Uh, I know he'd be happy to answer all the questions that came in. So after this session, your screen will automatically transition you to the next session. But as a reminder, there is a 15 minute break between each session throughout, throughout the conference today. If the registration page appears and you've already registered, just click the already registered link and enter your email address to enter the event. You will be able to access the CE survey and certificate by visiting beyondclean.net slash virtual events, and you will be automatically transferred to that page at the end of today's conference. All sessions will be available to you on demand to share and view after today's live event. 
We're so glad you're here and we'll see you back here in about 15 minutes.